What's you your name? Talk about this, um, Alex. Alex. Um, you talk about this uh, model of like how you create wealth, um, and that that kind of like changed the way that, that nonprofits work. Um, but the goal of your organization is essentially like to make money in, in order to, to distribute it. I mean, that's probably not exactly yeah. what it is, but it's to make money to distribute to these organizations. So you're really still like a not like a for profit. You're you're aiming to get as much money as you can, in a sense. Um, whereas like a lot of nonprofits. Um, actually, ha their goal is, is less about actually getting the money and, and more about like achieving something in the community or like going through some action. And so we've seen a lot of organizations that um, ha those kinds, the latter kind of organizations, which have a, a big conflict of interest between um, going through whatever they're doing, whether it's teaching kids or whatnot, and the raising of money, where you, just, you can kind of do this because you focus solely on the raising of money. How do you think it's h different for, for nonprofits that actually have some other very unrelated goal to, to use this kind of a method? Yeah, um, great question. Um, and I, so first I would say that we are, we, for many years we were almost exactly as you described us. When we adopted this childhood hunger uh, metric and goal, that started to change. So we've gone from being a, an organization that makes grants to all of these organizations to now one that is actually doing the kind of the community organizing. So we're spending a lot of money of our own, on our own program. So that, that has changed for us. But fundamentally, I think, you know, everything that I've talked about here, uh, and I should have said this, so I'm glad you've raised it, it's, it, it's really a means to an end, not an end in itself. And it's very important to see that, that, that way. So if you're the, if you're the, um, you know, the founder of uh, any mission-driven nonprofit, uh, and you're trying to just, first of all, you have to generate resources, right? You have to raise money. Uh, and I think that what you really need to do is figure out um, what are the, in effect, the cost benefits of different ways of doing it. So you could argue that for some organizations it would be very distracting to, in effect, start a marketing business, right? We, we, we almost have a marketing agency inside Share Our Strength, and the people we hire service all these accounts that I described, American Express and Gen Air. So that could be a distraction. Uh, but you could also argue that it's a huge distraction. Uh, I lived this, you know, read this with Alan Casey. I was on the board of City for 14 years. For the last three months of the fiscal year, uh, Alan is, you know, was calling everybody he knew, uh, not doing any work on the mission of City Year, but trying to keep the organization sustained by begging for money. So it's really a question of, um, you know, how do those opportunities and benefits weigh against each other? Uh, there, you know, we've increasingly seen a lot of organizations that, when they understand this as a means to an end, uh, they do it right and they kind of keep it in the right place in the organization. And the challenge for organizational leadership is to help everybody understand why you're doing this. So at Share Our Strength right now, we have a for-profit subsidiary in the same building, Community Wealth Ventures, and the people who work at the for-profit mostly get paid better than the people who work at the nonprofit, not because they're better or necessarily even more talented, but because the market values their time, talents in a certain way. Some of them work at consulting firms, some of them have MBAs, some of them have other types of that, you know, degrees that are valued a certain way. So, you know, my job is to help both organizations understand why that's good for everybody. And it's, it's new territory for nonprofits, so it's hard to do. Are there, yeah? Well, <clears throat> you spoke earlier about how a lot of organizations, it's not right for them. Yeah. Um, and especially in establishing a, you know, a revenue generating resource, a lot of times nonprofits, the literature says that they're, less li they're more likely to keep funding them even if they're not successful. Um, so it's sort of a larger risk involved. How would, what are the organizations that are, are primed for these that are not necessarily engaging in revenue generating uh, activities? That, that could be or should be? Yeah. Well, I would say organizations that are, first of all, they have to be stable to begin with. The, the unfortunate thing about this idea is it looks even more attractive to organizations that are desperate because they think it's, you know, an easy way to generate money and it's not. Um, Alan, Casey, who's a dear friend of mine, um, I know he's coming in here in a week or so. When, when he when he first understood what we were doing at Share Our Strength, he said, we have to do something like this at City Year because I've always wanted to make money while I sleep. Um, if you talk to most business people, they don't feel like they make money while they sleep. They make money when they're at the job 23 hours out of 24. So it's, you know, it's hard work. Uh, so an organization has to be financially stable. And I think it has to have developed some assets that are just you know, almost you're leaving money on the table. In Washington, there's a, there was an organization, a child care organization, that had served 2,000 low-income families, provided their child care, 
had to feed these kids a, a, a nutritious meal that met certain federal standards. The kids were spread across 20 sites, about 100 kids a site. So they created a food service facility, a kitchen, to make these meals. And if you ask them how many meals at the end of the year did they serve, they'll tell you 600,000. If you take a food service expert in to look at the kitchen, they'll say, well, that's a shame, because this was built to a capacity of a million, two meals a year, right? So you've built double the capacity. And your incremental costs of then going out and doing what they did, which was going to charter schools, going to assisted living centers for seniors, going to other child care providers saying, let us do your meals for you. The incremental costs were so small and the profit was so good that in their case it made sense. So, you know, I don't know that I could generalize beyond has to be stable, has to have assets, has to have leadership that's willing to make investments that don't pay off for the long term. I think this is the number one leadership issue in, in almost any organization is can you marshal the support for a vision that requires investments that don't may not pay off in the quarter, you know, may not pay off in the next year. But anything you want to do that's really big and bold, any cathedral that you're going to want to build, uh, it's going to take time. And you have to get over the natural human impatience with, for immediate gratification to do something great, I think. Yes? Uh, in your, in the, could you just give your names? Oh, yeah. Walt. Uh, thanks. <laughs> 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 Even though they, since the 2004 initiative, you've been partnering more, working with capacity building with your partnerships, you're still measuring the impacts by, it seems like, what your state partners and your grantees are doing instead of what you, you as an organization are specifically doing. Yeah. How much do you think that impact is due to just them as organizations? How much is it due to your actual influence on them and what you do to help them network and to uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I, I, I would tell you that I don't know the answer with specifics be, for a couple reasons. One is it, it takes a lot of partners to succeed at this. You know, in political campaigns and in advertising, they always say only 10% of what you do makes a difference, but nobody knows what 10% it is. You know, and the same, it, it, it's somewhat true here. We, we can only be successful if we have a lot of different partners. Uh, we've changed the way that we measure this, partly for, I think, the, you know, what you described to us started to feel very unsatisfactory. Uh, we don't really know the degree to which we're having a difference here. So the way we've changed our measurement is, particularly on this childhood hunger issue, uh, when, I, I, won't, I won't tell you something that will surprise you when you think about it. Uh, kids in this, hung, in, in this country are not hungry because we lack food. We don't. They're not even hungry because we lack, they lack access, because we lack food or nutrition programs, right? We have a plethora of federal, state, and local food and nutrition programs, public and private. Kids in this country, it's very different here than obviously in developing countries, kids in the United States are hungry because they lack access to existing programs for all kinds of reasons that would just make you, you know, mad as hell. They're just really lame reasons. In, in Washington, D.C., two summers ago, the district, which has one of the poorest urban communities in the country, turn back $5 million of already authorized and appropriated money from the federal government for the summer feeding program that is used to feed kids when schools are out of session. Uh, the problem with the summer feeding program is you can't use the schools. They're closed. So you have to organize parks and recs departments or Lions Club or what have you. The following year, we spent $35,000 to organize those sites, $5 million. It was kind of a tripwire that brought $5 million back into the district. I tell you this because the gap between kids who are eligible, millions, and kids who are enrolled uh, is pretty significant. And that's become our metric. Can we, as an organization, close that gap? Now, again, we know that we won't do it ourselves. And in fact, we're probably going to be more successful the less credit we take for doing it and the more credit we give to our partners because they are on the ground. But increasingly, the, the line between us and them is becoming more blurred. Uh, there was somebody here had a question. Sorry, yes, ma'am. Um, oh, I'm angered, by the way. Um, you mentioned several times that, for example, at the beginning of your organization, <coughs> you guys didn't want to accept any money from the federal government. Later you mentioned that, for example, now that President Obama has signed this um, bill or whatever it was, sorry, I don't remember, that you're interested in sort of partnering with him. To what extent do you think that organizations such as yours um, should 
partner with the government to sort of provide free meals to all children in schools? Would that be yeah. a legitimate way to, for example, affect all 13 million children and not just 13,000 with one very effective but expensive program? Yeah. Well, I think there are lots of ways. I'm glad you asked that because I think a partnership with the government is essential uh, really to solve these problems. And I think the question is what's the relative role and relationship between the various sectors? So I would argue that there are things that nonprofit organizations can do that government cannot do. We can take risks, we can be entrepreneurial, we can be closer to the people we serve, we can learn about how things really work uh, in reality, not just in theory. Um, those are Im important uh, benefits. And we can build programs that uh, the government probably wouldn't take the risk of building. But when it comes to really scaling them up, when it comes to, when it comes to making them available for everybody that needs them, you, it is very hard to do that without public support, meaning government support. Um, and so I think there's a, you know, a role for each. Whether that means we should start to get government money to do what we do, I don't know. I don't know that that is a good idea. I think, you know, at least in the case of our particular organization, I think we're better suited to inventing and innovating and, and doing the kind of things we've done over the last 20 years. But if you can get to the point where a President Obama says, well, we see that these programs work, they, need to, they simply need to be, we don't need to invent new ones, we need to make sure that these access issues are solved that I was just describing, uh, then I think there's a really important role for for the government there. I don't think you ultimately can do it without the government, but I don't think it means you necessarily have to take government money. Yeah. Hi, Amanda. Um, my question is, I have two. The first is the, the terminology you're using between the difference between partnerships and grantees. If you could just speak a moment about when that terminology was chosen and how, how much work you're doing within their organizations to consider them partners. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is, you talked about, you used your Timberland example, and everything you do you do with excellence, um, which I assume that folds down into who you choose as your partners. And so maybe you would talk a little bit about your metrics for how you choose your partners yeah. um, and how well they're doing, what you use. Yeah. Well, I, I particularly like the first part of that question because as a grant maker, uh, we have, as I mentioned, I think 250 grant recipients. And every year in the past, we've always had a couple of them that had come to us and said, we want to be more than a grant recipient. We want to be a partner. Um, and what they really mean by that, that translates into we want to be a bigger grant recipient, <laughs> right? So if we go from 50,000 to 200,000, we're going to be partners somehow. And of course, I think a partnership as don't both sides get something out of this. Uh, but I think what we've started to do is, uh, and it kind of gets to you, the second part of your question is, we've started to be a lot more proactive. So at one end, we have this open process where you can apply for funds from Share Our Strength. And over the years now, it's, it's you know, 25 years into this, we know who most of the good, effective organizations are, and, and it's, not, it's not that big a community that that's hard to solve. But increasingly, we've been more proactive in going out and looking for somebody. So when I use partner, I think of it more in terms of we go to Florida Impact, which is an advocacy organization based in Florida, knows the local legislature, knows the local issues better than we do. And we say, we know that 70% of the hungry kids in this country, 70% of the kids who are not accessing these eligible services live in 10 states, and Florida is one of them. And you're there, and we're not, but we have money, and you don't. Do you want to partner up and do this together? And together, set the milestones, and together, evaluate our progress, and together, decide what gaps we have and what we need to hire for. Um, so part, that, that becomes real partnership for us. Yes? <clears throat> So you spoke about how Clara Miller said that um, traditional nonprofits who are enterprise blind are often enterprise unfriendly. And I'm wondering if that viewpoint um, has ever hindered your ability to work with some programs that are already in existence. And if so, like how do you combat that kind of obstacle to a synergistic like, yeah. team? Well, it does. I mean, Clara, what, what Clara said was that philanthropy is enterprise blind and therefore enterprise unfriendly. And so when we, it, to the extent that we meet with foundations, and now that we are older and more established, there are foundations that have come to us and they say, boy, we love the results you're getting. We, you know, we want to consider funding you. So where it does interfere with our ability is most foundations, not all, this it, it's gotten, it's become more progressive uh, over the last few years. That most foundations, and certainly most corporate partners, and certainly most do donors, they want to fund the hard costs of what you're doing. They want to fund the program. 
So they want to put all these handcuffs on the dollars that say, don't use it for salaries here, don't use it for headquarters, use it to buy food. We don't need to buy food. There's lots of food in the country. All the food gets donated. You need it for warehousing and refrigeration and transportation and a lot of things like that if it's a private food assistance program. Uh, and, and the hardest thing of all to fund is what I just described as kind of the community organizing that's necessary. That's where the real leverage is, if it's successful. Sometimes it's not, but the idea of we're going to give you money and you're going to go into communities and organize, people think of you holding protest signs or something like that, you know, as opposed to actually working to, in a very sophisticated way, how do you create these sites for summer feeding so that kids, you know, get the $5 million flows in. It's, uh, you don't have long to really explain what you're doing and people have short attention spans to hear this, but it's not a, it's not a simple solution. Uh, emergency food assistance, food banking, that type of stuff, is very simple, but obviously kind of a Band-Aid on a much deeper problem. Um, and so we do see where that kind of philosophy gets in the way. It would be like going into a restaurant across the street and saying, I've noticed you have a few empty tables, so I'd like to order the bacon and eggs. I don't really want to pay for those flowers on the table, and I don't want to pay for the, you know, the, the, the cleaning help. I just want to pay for the bacon, whatever the hard cost of the bacon and eggs are. It would never cross your mind to say that. but. They say it every day, every time in the nonprofit sector. And so, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Follow but, like, but what do you do to like kind of get over that? Because you have been able to pull in. Well, I think you you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. You have to say, well, then you know we can't work from you. You have to be willing to walk away. You have to try to educate, and there are people doing that. There's a very interesting book out right now by a man named Dan Pallotta. It's called Uncharitable, um, and it's brand new. Um, I'm trying to think where he's he's done a couple books parties and events. I can't remember if he's doing one here, but the point of the book is Dan Pallotta invented the AIDS rides and the breast cancer walks. He had a company called Pallotta Teamworks. It was a for-profit company. He made, a, he made a reasonable amount of money doing it. Some might even say a lot of money doing it. You know, he probably had a salary somewhere between three and four hundred thousand dollars. And people got uncomfortable with that. So I think the, the, the Avon uh, team decided that Dan, one, one year, Dan Pallotta helped them raise $71 million. They didn't like his $400,000 salary, so they fired him. He basically got driven out of the, the business, and he went away for 10 years, and he, now he's come back and he's written this book. Uh, the next year, without Dan Pallotta, Avon raised $16 million instead of 71. Now, so what's the point? Who are they helping, right? But there's this sense of, like, man, no way. And, that's, and that was over $300,000. They were willing to sacrifice $50 million for the research and even to learn more about cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Justin, by the way, um, you mentioned before competition. I completely agree with you about competition. You need to be a, a greater focus for nonprofits. Um, but it seems to me, and we've addressed it with some previous speakers too, that one of the main hindrances to real competition is there's no easy playing field because there is no way to measure performance or impact across you know different categories of nonprofits. So, how do you see nonprofits and funders addressing that issue? Yeah. It's really tough. I mean, there's a lot of intellectual ferment around this very notion right now in the sector. I think a beginning place is the some of the things that we've talked about, which is saying, you know, at least as an organization, we're going to tell you we're going to accomplish a particular objective. It still doesn't help. I mean, if you have $10,000 to invest in uh, Share Our Strength or Teach for America or, or City Year, there's no apples to apples measurement on what you're going to get back. So I don't know how you do that, um, except probably um, investing in, and I think this goes to another question, part of your question, investing in leadership. I mean, so we look, we, we look to make judgments about the leadership of organizations. And, uh, and implicit in that is it's leadership that has a track record of achievement and outcomes. The truth is, things change a lot in the social sector, so I could, you know, I, you and I could sign up and have a contract that, you know, you're going to give us a certain amount of money and we're going to have a certain outcome. And the needs could change. The legislature could come in and uh, make sure that all the summer feeding sites, for example, were set up and that money could be better spent somewhere else. So it's a very dynamic process. And again, in, in business, you listen to your marketplace. You're not handcuffed to spend your dollars a certain way. You can move marketing dollars. You can move research dollars. You, you move around where the market tells you it needs to be. You need to do that in the nonprofit sector as well. And as a result, some of your 
outcome metrics are going to change. Well, as a proponent of this, I mean, do you, would you want funding to go to some sort of an institution that, you know, can create some sort of a general, I mean, how do you, uh, you know, uh, yeah. promote that? Yeah, well, this, uh, this, this connects to this Dan Pilata who I was just talking about. He's advocating that there be some type of public institution that measures nonprofits on a qualitative basis rather than, you know, if you look, there's a, a number of internet uh, tools now like GuideStar or Charity Navigator that use what I would describe as overly simplistic formulas. They'll add up your total revenues, they'll divide by your number of staff, and they'll say you're either efficient or not efficient. They, they don't really tell you that much. Uh, so I, I really don't know. I mean, I, because it could be so subjective, the, the Pilata idea, the one that you're suggesting, that there be somebody that, that puts some type of qualitative rating on an organization, I think is probably a good idea. Uh, just you'd have to be careful because it could be abused. Yeah. Do you feel like there's you know, some kind of innate um, advantage um, you know, that you guys have because you're doing specifically with child hunger? Um, so sort of backgrounds, you know, we were kind of talking about the, uh, the Dana Farber Institute and how they have, you know, their cancer treatment for adults and the Jimmy function specifically for kids. We seem to kind of say that, you know, when dealing with children, there's this kind of, you know, sentimentality that people have naturally, you know, towards children. And so, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, you know, when you were starting out originally, you know, with your two thousand um, dollars, you sent out all those letters, you know, if, if in those letters you had said, you know, we're interested in ending, you know, adult hunger, you know, for adults who maybe, you know, are you know, con and ex cons or, or, or you know, I know, drug abuse people, you know, would you have not elicited the same kind of response you had if you were saying, you know, dealing with the this you know, visible problem of child hunger? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, when we started, that's what we did, which is why I think we didn't get any response uh, for those first couple thousand letters. We didn't really uh, adopt childhood hunger as a priority focus until about three years ago. And the reason we did was partly, I think, goes to what you're talking about, is we thought people would have a handle on it. But the real reason we did it is, is we were trying to figure out for ourselves, if for nobody else, and some of this has to do with you know, the way people are going to judge you, but some of it has to do with you do this work for 20 years and you go home at night and you think, what is my, you know, effort added up to? So we decided, let's find something that we can achieve a victory on. And we did research in lots of different areas. The, <clears throat> the writer Jonathan Kozel says you should pick battles that are important enough to matter but small enough to win. Uh, and I like that construct because we've got 37 million Americans that live below the poverty line. It's going to be hard to solve that problem. We've got two billion people on the planet that live, you know, on a dollar a day. Probably can't solve that problem. So where can we look for something that's important enough to matter but small enough to win? And as we drilled down in all the different places where we worked, we realized that we were actually on the, what seemed like on the cusp of a victory with children. That if you measured <laughs> census department data, agriculture department data, the number of kids who are hungry on a chronic basis, separate from food insecure, separate from living in families that at the end of the month may have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from, but kids who literally day after day are hungry, that actually becomes a very manageable number. Uh, and our belief was, let's win that one, not for the purpose of patting ourselves on the back and going home, but for the purpose of saying, we know how to solve these problems, we're going to go climb the next higher hill, hopefully we've got the bona fides and the credibility and the additional resources that come with that if we do succeed. So that was the, that was the thinking. Yes. My name's Sarah, by the way. <coughs> I'm interested in learning more about your decision to work through the sort of high-end culinary industry. Mm. How, I guess what was the theory of change behind that? Why did you target that industry and how do you think it's helped you? Yeah. Um, the, so the theory of change, um, which of course we had no such term when we started, mm -hmm. no such idea. Um, it, it was really very simple and partly lucky. Aren't you uh, all the, lucky, the, you see? The, yeah. <laughs> the, the simple part was, you know, we really did have this sense that we would, um, that they would feel a connection to our issue. And as I said, some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them were asked to do all kinds of different things, raise money for the zoo, the kidney foundation, this and that. Uh, but we thought we could get to the point, point where there would be a tipping point, which we ultimately got to, where so many chefs and restaurateurs had made this their issue that it became kind of the industry's cause. Uh, and partly we got very lucky in the sense that chefs became kind of celebrities and cooking shows started and there's Iron Chef stuff now and all, that, all this type of thing and, um, and 
you know, we hit that at just the right time. So whether we would have stuck with this if we didn't, I don't know. But I'll tell you, the other part of it for me was the notion that the, 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 the usual suspects were not enough. We didn't want to just kind of preach to the choir. There are lots of great people out there doing anti-hunger work. If there were enough of them, we wouldn't have the hunger problems that we do. So our notion was, let's go out and get a group of people who don't think of themselves as social activists, don't think of themselves as political, don't think of themselves as necessarily able to make a difference in the community, and create a vehicle that will help them see how they can do that. Um, and so we've obviously wanted to do that in other industries as well. We don't feel like we're even finished doing that in the industry we work in. We started out at fine dining. We've subsequently expanded into casual dining and everything from Capital Grill to Cheesecake Factory to P.F. Chang's. <coughs> They're all now getting involved with Share Our Strength and they've really fueled our, our growth. Um, and in fact, this model has changed significantly, partly because we needed to, to grow it, partly because it was somewhat limiting, although it served us extremely well, and partly because of the recession that we're now in. Uh, American Express has been a partner of ours for 16 years. For the last five years, they've had a marketing contract with us that was $600,000 for each of the last five years. Uh, this year, they came to us and they said, we just laid off 7,500 American Express employees. We just asked the federal government for $3.5 billion. There's not a single marketing contract in this company that's going to be the same size as it was last year. So let's figure out what we can do with you. And they don't expect the same amount of value either, of course, but it was like, let's figure out what we can do together for $300,000. So we saw lots of examples of that, and we had to be very agile at looking at you know, other parts of the industry, because Amex was interested in the high end, and, and companies that could use their company not to take money out of their corporate treasury, but give us access to their consumer base. Hickory Farms, cheese baskets and uh, sausages and things like that, really old, kind of tired brand. Uh, they came up with this idea, let's ask our consumers to donate a dollar at the end of a transaction. It's not an original idea. Uh, and Hickory Farms' model, by the way, is to lose money for 50 weeks a year. And then at Christmas, they put kiosks in 800 malls. And in two weeks, they make a very significant amount of money. 177,000 of their consumers did the dollar check off for Share Our Strength. eBay did a similar thing for us in five days, raised $57,000. So, but we had to really think, we love this model, but we can't stick with it you know, beyond reason. Yeah. Um, my name is Yasef. Uh, could you tell us about how the brand you created helped you um, get money from all the different sources to the point that they don't care how you use it, they just give you money and you know, use it? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, to us, this is really I mean, one of the most important issues because, as I said, if, if Evian is getting their marketing value, it would be nice to think that Evian is doing this because they care about hungry kids. Uh, and I believe and I think I could show you and, and convince you that at the end of their time with us, or even now, <coughs> there are a significant number of people in Evian who really have personally found a lot of meaning in this and I think will stay involved as activists. But initially the contract was we need to get a certain number of bottles on a certain number of tables in a certain number of restaurants. And if you can do that, we know our sales are going to go up and that's how we're going to measure this. So that gave us a lot of flexibility. We just did a, a Anheuser-Busch has a, a Belgian brand called Stella Artois. You know, they were just bought by a Belgian company. And they want Stella to be the, the, the beer, I have to say this right, because they're paying us a lot of money. They want this to be the beer that wine drinkers drink. <coughs> okay, so they want to be in, they want to be in 40 of our events. Uh, and in fact, they've been in three so far, and there was a huge number of people who came to these fancy events that would just love to have a beer at the end of the evening. Um, and so they're very happy. They're paying us three hundred thousand dollars, and they really, you know, the, now the people who worked on it said, you know, I've been in the alcohol and beverage business for eighteen, twenty years. You know, I've always wanted there to be more meaning in my work. So I think they are personally excited about it. But it was a it was a very basic corporate marketing decision. Uh, and we like that because we feel like it enables us to use those dollars in ways that otherwise might be not well understood enough to use. And, and the building the brand was just <laughs> making sure that we deliver the value back. So, and that's a lot of work. I mean, I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy. I think it's every bit as much work as chasing philanthropic dollars. It's just a different pond that's a little less crowded. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paige. Um, my question is that, so the goal of this organization is ideally to end um, 
hunger for children, but there's also the component of educating children about nutrition and, and making sure they have access to um, nutritional foods. How do you balance the two? Because sometimes providing food for a kid is not necessarily giving them the most nutritious meal. And I understand that you have this program that seeks to educate um, children and their families. But yeah. how do you ensure that students, or students, that children, I guess, have both? Yeah. Uh, great question. I don't know that we have ensured it in the past. I mean, we've talked a lot among ourselves. We spent a lot of time in schools and, and really schools in really rough neighborhoods. And uh, I've seen school lunches where I've thought, gosh, there's no way I want to give dollars to expand that program because it could hurt more kids than it helps. I mean, we've seen some really, you know, just kind of almost shocking stuff. Uh, so, I mean, what we've tried to do is we've tried to build nutrition education into what we do. We've tried to uh, work with companies that are going to improve their uh, nutrition education work. You know, Cisco is an interesting example of a company. Cisco Foods, big company, has these big trucks that supply restaurants with just the basics. Uh, they, uh, over the last probably five years, have cultivated such enlightened leadership inside the company about how they need to just completely change their model so they're transporting locally grown and sustainably produced and things like that. I mean, they've, they've seen it from a business point of view. That's where the world is going. So some companies resist that for as long as they can. Some try to get in front of it. So we try to work with the companies that are getting in front of that. Um, and we're also trying to work with, for example, in New Haven, there's a, my sister started Share Our Strength with me and she, we still sit next to each other 25 years later, which is whole not, for a whole nother class. Um, but uh, she's in New Haven today meeting with a chef named Tim Cipriani, who was a chef at a commercial restaurant, now runs the, um, the school food program there and wants to you know, work with Share Our Strength to make sure that exactly the kind of issues that you're talking about are addressed. For so long, the issue was quantitative. There just wasn't, there weren't enough kids getting anything, that there wasn't this focus on nutrition, but it's, it's starting to develop in a lot of organizations now. Um, my name is Jason Shaw. Your anecdote about cathedral builders really resonated with me. Um, <coughs> but I feel like right now in social entrepreneurship with phenomenon like Founder's Dilemma or when Cheryl Dorsey came in, she said that I forget the exact number, but tons of nonprofits and new social enterprises are being created every day. Um, probably because people want to start their own thing, and not necessarily be that cathedral builder and contribute to this larger cause. So, what sort of specific strategies are you either personally taking, or do you envision the community at large taking, so that people kind of mobilize towards causes rather than organizations? Hmm. Um, so, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure how you would how we would get them to mobilize towards causes. One thing that I guess that we're trying to do as an organization is make it possible for people to even have careers in one place. So a lot of uh, there's a lot of churn in the nonprofit sector, uh, partly because people want to start things and then they want to start something else, but partly because they start something and uh, then they have school loans to pay off, or then they get married and then they have kids and then they have health, need health care. You know, a lot of things. So I mean, as an organization, we've decided that we're really going to do the things we've we've talked about. We're going to pay people well. We're going to be competitive on that score. We're going to have a, you know, an HR effort that creates a career track for somebody so that you can actually build a career at HR strength. That was, I mean, 15 years ago, there were some people that did that, but it was mostly unheard of. You just couldn't afford to do it for long. Uh, so I think part of it is financial. And part of it, I think, has to do with this very delicate balance of setting goals that are uh, ambitious and inspiring, like the vision of, the, of, of what the cathedral could look like. Uh, but also having milestones between here and there that make them seem not so unrealistic, even if it is going to take 100 years, that it's, it's kind of worth doing today. So I think it's probably more art than science, but it's, it's hard to do. Yeah. Um, so it seems like a lot of our speakers that have come in have talked a little about sort of how um, having a pretty small office is, uh, it makes it hard to reach more. Can you talk a little bit about like, sort of your central office and um, how many people you have hired and so on? Yeah, um, we've got uh, a headquarters staff in Washington that um, for many years was small. Now it's about 55 or 60. Um, so it's still not you know, very large. But, uh, and then we have, uh, there's a couple exceptions. We maybe have three people in the field that are on our payroll. I think one of the things that was different, again, about our model is the fact that we made chefs and restaurateurs at the core of this. And most of them really feel like they own the organization, that it's their organization. If you ask Gordon Hammersley at Hammersley's Bistro, what's his relationship to Share Strength? I don't think he'd say I do events for them. 
a couple times a year, I think you'd say that's our organization. But the advantage of having a Gordon Hammersley uh, at your core and you know, 10,000 like him uh, is that they have resources. They're successful business people. They have staffs. They have a physical plant. They have a PR firm. They have a bank. They have a, a radio station on which they advertise or whatever. So they're able to bring a lot of that to us. So for us, for an organization that you know, is headquartered in Washington but wanted to have a presence in 60, 70, 80 other cities, uh, it really helped to attract those types of people. They're real, you know, they're achievers, but they're also, they're institutions in their community. Um, and it just, it gave us a presence that we otherwise wouldn't have. I mean, it's, it's almost like every city we go to, we have an office. We can always, you know, call Gordon and say, we're in Boston for the next three days. Can we work out of your office or that type of thing? So, yeah. My name is Jason. Um, so, just going off the idea of you, you spreading from Washington to lots of different cities, um, different you know organizations that we've looked at have kind of spread haphazardly, kind of where people have contacts, whereas you know, other organizations pick which cities they're going to. How did you grow? How did you pick which cities and which restaurants you're going to go to? Was it opportunistic or was it planned? Uh, it was a little bit of both, opportunistic and planned. We got uh, so, for example, with Taste of the Nation, uh, we. At one point, today we're in, I think, 55 or 60 cities. At one point, we were in 95 cities. Uh, and we realized that the incremental work to be in those cities. So when we sell a sponsorship to, to American Express or Anheuser-Busch, they're interested in 12 cities. Right? All the major marketers are interested in where you would expect, Los Angeles, you know, San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, New York, whatever. Um, so we're, they're paying us $300,000 because they care about 12 cities, and we're delivering value back to them in 90 cities. Uh, and we've got a small staff, and you know the incoming that you have by doing an, events in 90 cities, all volunteer outside of this paid staff in Washington, was too much, and, and so it just wasn't efficient. So we, you know, pulled in. Right now, we're dealing with this issue in a in a very real time way, uh, as this childhood hunger strategy of ours. As we go to a community like Florida, which I mentioned, find a partner, Florida Impact, or so forth, we figure out where we can be successful doing that. Uh, our, our theory of change on that is that ultimately it needs to be a pool strategy, not a push strategy. We need some successes that are so unambiguous in a few places that other states, other governors, other advocacy organizations say, in effect, please come do that here. Uh, so now we're being very careful about how we think about that, and we've gone through a lot of work to identify what are our criteria. We have to have some political influence. We have to have a partner on the ground. There has to be high need so that the issue is compelling. But it's, it's a good question. I think most organizations start out in a pretty unsophisticated way and then grow towards sophistication. The question is, can you close that gap? So not everybody retreads the same ground. Yes? Hi, I'm Lee. Um, my question, I guess, is about your sponsorships and cause marketing. And what kind of factors that you consider when you look to companies to partner with besides, mm. I guess, in conjunction with the amount of money they're providing you? Yeah, great question. Um, so for some of the reasons that I've mentioned, the fact that we're all volunteer, uh, it's very important that our network of people feel very good about who our partners are. So if somebody wants to pay us a million dollars and we like them but, our, but Gordon Hammersley doesn't, then we've got a big problem. Uh, so we have a lot of screens that we put companies through, mission appropriate, um, uh, kind of corporate social responsibility screens. I, the, the, the important message that I would leave you with here is that uh, it's very difficult. These are not black and white issues all the time. So one of the examples I'll give you is Tyson Foods came to us. They're the largest producer of poultry in the company. Then they acquired a big beef company. So they're an enormous organization, I think $28 billion. Uh, they said they wanted to partner with Share Strength. There's a lot of problems with Tyson Foods. Um, they have all kind of fair labor allegations against them. At least they did seven or eight years ago when they came to us. Environmental issues, it's a, just a dirty business. Poultry requires a lot of water, there's a lot of runoff, all kind of headaches. We weren't comfortable with it. They were going to pay us $5 million over three years and donate 10 million pounds of high protein food, which you don't get in this business. You get lots of day old bread and potato chips and things like that. It's what the food banks get. So we said no. Now, here's what happened the CEO, John Tyson, called me up and said, uh, you know, basically, Billy, this is John. Johnny, he says, you know, I want to tell you something. He says, my daddy ran this. This is my daddy's company for a lot of years. And my daddy did a lot of bad things. He says, everybody knows that. He says, we're still doing some bad things. Not as many as my daddy did. Uh, he says, we'd like to be doing even fewer. 
And we feel like we'd get there faster if we had a partner at the table that could keep us honest. So would you reconsider? What would you do? Anybody? Yeah. I should approve it first, Okay, fair. Yeah, that's that's fair. And keep in mind you can do a lot of good in the world with five million dollars and ten million pounds of high protein. Food. Would anybody grab it? Take it? Anybody rule it out? Yeah? With a significant trial period and a contract and noticeable change? Yes. Okay. All right, so here's what happened. Um, we we ended up doing it, okay? And, and, I, and I think they did get better in some ways, but not, not better in, in, in a material enough way that would make you happy. And it was kind of a work in progress. And then they closed a plant. Uh, and, so our, and our volunteers were very iffy about it. You know, they were kind of, we had to basically sell them on the fact that, and, and I think to your point, the prove it point, a lot of it goes to is there real sincerity in that statement. Obviously, it's an attractive statement if it's sincere and committed and authentic. Uh, but if it's not, then there's a problem. So our volunteers were, I would say, sketchy on this at best. Then they closed a plant in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, and one of our best, just the most earnest, passionate volunteers runs our Manchester event. Uh, and he calls me up and he said, I cannot be part of this organization anymore. Uh, 500 people are out of work. You're partnering with them. We're supposed to be helping hungry people. They're creating more of them. Uh, you know, so I'm gone. So I said to him, this is, I know we got to get out of here. I said to him, tell me an example of a company you think is a good company. He's in New Hampshire, and Timberland's headquartered there, so he knows Timberland. And he said, Timberland. I said, well, I'm glad you raised that. I'm on the board. I said, what if I told you that they closed every one of their plants in the United States in the last 10 years, which they did. You know, all their shoes are made in China. He was like, I didn't know that. I said, are they still a good company? He said, yeah. I said, but I just didn't know that. So I say that, <laughs> I say that only because it's very complicated stuff. I mean, there's plenty of deals we've walked away from. Certainly tobacco companies try to buy goodwill with child health and things like that. We've walked away from all those. There's been a lot of manufacturing deals where products are made with labor that we can't certify for ourselves we're comfortable with. But there are other things that are they're more gray than they are black and white. So I know we've got to wrap up. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.